You're watching the Merlin Players Show. All right, my guest today is from Sussex, Virginia. His jersey is retired at Sussex Central High, the only NBA player to attend that high school. Uh, transitioned to the University of Maryland in 1986, from 86 to 1990. Played in 112 games, started 83 of them. Only Turk to play for three different head coaches. Uh, for his career, averaged 52.3% uh, from the field, 12 points per game, six and a half rebounds. For his career, 1,354 points, 722 rebounds, 97 blocks, 61 steals. In his sophomore year, he averaged 10 points per game, five and a half rebounds, one block, and shot 52% from the field. In his junior year, Averaged 16 and a half points per game, eight rebounds, one block, 56% from the field. In that junior year, he had 226 rebounds, which was good for seventh in the ACC that year, 1989. In his senior year, 1990, averaged 18 points per game, which was eighth in the ACC during that time. 10 rebounds. It was all, He was one of only two players in the ACC that averaged double figures in rebounds that year. One block, 51% from the field. Had 214 rebounds total that season in the senior year, which good for third in the ACC. Second team, all ACC in 1990. First team, all ACC tourney in 1989. 43rd pick in the 1990 NBA draft to the San Antonio Spurs. Played in the NBA and overseas for 16 years. Played in... 683 NBA games, we had 4,239 points, 3,000 rebounds, 266 assists. Ain't know he had that many assists. He didn't pass that much, but all right. And he averaged 6.2 points per game, 4.3 rebounds. <laughs> Has an NBA championship with the Spurs in 2004-2005 season. Won two championships in Barcelona former sports show host on the Hoops Wizards, author of a book called Lessons from Lenny, and a sports analyst for the Wizards and the Go-Go's currently. Welcome to the show, Tony Massenberg. What's up, my man? What's up, Wizard? Man, you know what? <laughs> that there man ran down my whole year, literally <laughs> from, from freshman year to the end of my career. And That's it. <laughs> Was excellent, bro. You you just told me some stuff about myself I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> you missed one though, man. You missed What's one. That? One thing out of all of that stuff you call. What's that? World, well, champion. Well, World champion in two thousand. No, I said that NBA championship with the Spurs, two thousand four, two thousand five. Oh, okay. Man, now, trust I ain't forget that. I all this stuff, man. I even leave that out. <laughs> hey, definitely ain't leave that out, bro. <laughs> That's one hell of an introduction right there, man. Hey, wow. man, thanks for joining the show, man. I appreciate you so much. Let's get right into it. So what was it like, man, growing up for you as a youngster in Sussex, Virginia, in the, in the Massenburg household? Well, first of all, um, you got to start my story out with the fact that I'm an only child. OK, so the whole sibling rivalry thing and playing against your big brothers and all that stuff, I didn't get any of that. Right. I was a foul. So the only people I really got to play basketball against were like my next door neighbor who was, you know, a year younger than me and smaller than me. Because, you know, obviously I was the biggest kid in school. So <laughs> I played as a, as a kid, as a shorty, like fourth, fifth grade, we we would play. And of course, my uncle, who I just told you about. And, and used to cheat. You know how you got that uncle yes, who's like, like 12 to 13 years older. He's like the youngest uncle, but he's close he's close enough in your age. And then he yeah. cheats, you know what I mean? <laughs> beat you up and stuff, you know what I mean? Because he's a grown man and you're a kid. So I had that type of experience growing up um, as an only child. Obviously spent a lot of time by myself because, you know, that's, that's just what it is growing up in the country. And I didn't really get to see my yeah. friends until I went to school. So, um, you know, just being an only child, man, I, I watched a lot of television. I played a lot. I rode my bike, you know, for miles and miles, 
you know, away from my house. I come from a big extended family with cousins. So that's really, you know, the people who really filled in for like my brothers and sisters. So I feel like I didn't really miss out on that as much because I have a huge extended family. Yeah. So, so Maz, um, you were you were not a all American in high school or what have you. So, going through the process of choosing what school you wanted to go to, uh, why did you choose the University of Maryland? How did that that process come about? Well, first of all, we're coming from a small town. Uh, people have to recognize that you don't get a lot of exposure, um, not even like statewide. You don't get a lot until you like make a big splash. Like the biggest guy from our, you know, from our area, 15 minutes from me in Petersburg was Moses Malone. So yeah, like- AAU, AAU wasn't running as rapid as it is now, so. There was no AAU. No, you don't understand. With the part of Virginia where I've been, there was no AAU. There was only a summer league um, over at Petersburg High School during the summer. So that was the closest thing we got to being able to play organized basketball. So, when you talk about the exposure whiz, I didn't have any, right? I, I was known uh, locally. The first couple of schools that started recruiting me was like uh, VCU, Virginia State, Richmond, uh, like Emory and Henry. I could remember these letters like it was yesterday. <laughs> so until I went to Five Star at the end of my junior year, going into my senior year that summer that's when I got the exposure and I went to five star and got to obviously compete against the top dudes in the country and I ended up leaving there a standout and at that point um that's when I got the attention of the University of Maryland and I was approached by first Sherman Dillard um now an assistant coach at Iowa uh with uh Fred uh with uh, uh Franny and Sherman uh Gage asked me, expressed interest, you know, if I like the University of Maryland. And, and again, you got to think about this, Wiz, you know, I, you know, you know how that is, Wiz, when you get that, you know what I mean? You, yeah. you, you try to fool, like, on your excitement level, like, okay, I'll let them know how, like, you know, they my number one school, you know, of all time. I, I can't let them know that right now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like Maryland, you know, it's close to home, yada, 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 right? You know, this is how I'm playing it with Sherman. <laughs> Meanwhile, like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is what I'm saying to myself, trying to keep it cool, right? So, yeah. Sherman, well, I'm, I'm, coach, I'm going to have Coach Lefty Giselle get in touch with you. You know who Lefty is, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I know Coach Giselle, you know, yada, 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 me more. I'm like, oh, wow, Lefty, do I know Lefty? So, <laughs> later, I'm going to the camp. Then I'm approached by Lefty. And Lefty, you know, like I told you, Wiz, I told you the story a million times. How you doing, son? You know, I can watch hey, you know, I respect the way you play, son. You know, you mind me of Buck Williams, son. You know, Maryland. Let me turn you into an all American. You know, you come play the <laughs> game all by the time you do your son. You, you know, sound so. just like him, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, Wiz, I heard it. Yo, I played for him for a year. So you remember, Wiz, I got there in 85. That was the other day. I got there in 1980. That's right. That's yeah, right. I got a whole year with Lefty and Lenny, man. So, so you know, when I get this spill from, from, from Lefty at Five Star, I am literally ready to sign right there. If he had a letter in his hand right now, I could have signed. I would have signed. <laughs> Right, that was how I felt in my mind. But I'm like, nah, you know, I got to keep it cool. You know, let him, you know, let him think that, I, you know what I mean? I won't let him know they got it in the bag. Play the game a little bit, yeah. Like that. <laughs> For sure, man. Um, I got, you know, I got letters from all over the country, from UCLA, other bunch of other West Coast schools, uh, a couple of ACC schools. I actually ended up visiting Wake Forest. By the time I narrowed it down to my five, I think I had Maryland at the top, uh, Wake Forest because they were in the ACC because I loved ACC basketball growing up in Virginia and uh, South Carolina, Virginia Tech, and I can't remember who the other one was. I think it's one more. I can't remember. Um, but but I it was always Maryland. It's funny because out of the five visits that you can have at that time, I took three. Maryland was my third one, and. I told my parents after taking a visit and being, you know, hanging out with Keith Gatlin and, and hanging out with Lenny and having them take me out, take me to Bentley's and all that. Met Speedy. That's where I first met Speedy. Uh, Terry Long, like all those guys, like the Keith, like I was like seeing Lenny 
and Adrian was mind blowing for me. Like my junior year, think about that with yeah. Phil and, and Lynn Bias and Keith Gatlin, like, like all like, okay, all right, I ain't gonna get to play with Adrian, but I'm gonna get to play with Lenny and Keith. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I was done. I was done. So once they, once I hung out with them, they took me to the dorms, you know, all around campus and everything. I saw all the love Lenny and Keith was getting. I was like, okay, this is the place for me. This is the place for me. So the country boy is my at that point. Like, got to be here. It's only two and a half hours from home. So uh, on my ride back home from Maryland, I remember being in the back of the car with my parents and saying to myself, like, yo, you know, this is, like, I don't want to take no more visits. I'm ready to sign. Like, let's just get this over with. I, I, I want to go to Maryland. I was in love with the University of Maryland. So the rest is history. So, Mass, man, I mean, that must have been a great experience, uh, you know, playing with the great Lynn Bias and, and those guys, man. And uh, I had the opportunity to write a book with you called Lessons from Lenny. You know, and that was just, uh, it was just such a great time because I got to sit back and hear stories, you know, that you had, uh, you know, just being around Lynn and things that you learned from him and all of that stuff, man. So it was just such a pleasure going through that process. What, what would you personally like people to take away from, from reading that book, Lessons from Lenny? You know, one thing is, you know, we talk about the greatness of the basketball player, but the thing that I want people to understand a little bit about the person, and, and that's where I talk about his influence and 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 the the work ethic, and and the, just the attitude and the approach toward the game. Like I, I would like to think that I, I got you know I emulated some of that from Lenny, and I guess you know anybody emulating somebody else to a, to a certain degree is just their interpretation of you know what they learned from that person. And everybody has kind of like their own spin on somebody's game. Like your game, your yeah. game is all reminded me of, of the Iceman, but it's it's like it's got elements of Magic Johnson. But when you put the you know a little bit of Iceman and a little bit of Magic together, you know, I think you got the Wizard. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It ain't Magic, and it ain't Iceman. It's the Wizard. So for me, it's like when I look at my game, it was you know I tried to do everything that I saw Lenny do as far as the elevation on his jump shot the jump hooks, uh, you know, his his turnaround jump shot, uh, you know, those things, the things that I thought I could emulate that I saw that were effective for him, for, effective for him, were basically unstoppable. Um, you know, those things I tried to emulate. But at the end of the day, my game was probably closer to Buck Williams, who I also tried and take elements from because I saw how effective he was as a dude who, you know, I only had, you know, less than an inch on, Buck was 6'8", I'm barely 6'9", and I play close, you know, but I play a similar style uh, to Buck, and that was, Lefty was the first one that pointed that out to me. So in my mind, my blueprint uh, was always going to be, I wanted to be able to shoot buckets like Len Bias and play inside like Buck Williams, you know, and and so have and blend the two. And I think that's what my game kind of ended up being. And you know, I never got to play with, with Buck Williams, but I did get to play with Lenny and I saw what made him great, you know, from the, the, the work ethic, you know, the, 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 the work he put in, in the weight room, the, the way he carried himself on the court, meaning like he was always serious when he was on the basketball court, it was about business. And it was about letting people know, you know, once you were out there, you were about to make an impact. And, and I always tried to bring that part and that element to the game, but that stuff started with Lynn Bias because for me, you know, coming straight out of, you know, out of high school, out the country, you know, and coming up here, you know, to the big time, I was playing with the best basketball player, you know, pro, uh, uh, amateur basketball player in America. And Lynn Bias, Lynn Bias was in everybody's mind, the best basketball player in the country, you know, outside of the NBA, because at that time, you know, big men were still dominating the game. Yeah. So Brad Doherty ended up being the number one pick was because Cleveland needed a center. But, but if they wanted, they needed the best player, they would have took Lynn Bias. So, yeah. so, so that's what I tried to take uh, as much from his greatness as I could and, and try to, in the, in the process, make myself into a good player. Well, I tell you what, you, you certainly had that combination of being very physical down low, big, strong dude, but being able to step away from the basket and shoot the ball as well. So you had that versatility 
no doubt. I remember when I got the ball in my hand off the rebound, the first thing I did was look for you running down the floor, man, because, you know, you, you were a hell of a runner out there, man, for especially how big you were, you know, and so I was just always amazed at how big and physical you were, but how uh, light, you, light you were on your feet, man. So you were the first person I looked for when I got that ball, man, for sure. So so um, you played for, for three different coaches, man. Lefty, uh, Coach Wade, and then finished off with Coach Williams. What, how did that impact uh, you as a person and, and your growth in the game? Well, let me tell you this, Will. Um, you, you just said it right there. Now, under the circumstances, when you consider the, the, you know, in 86, we were coming out of the aftermath, you know, of, of the tragedy and, and still, you know, being investigated, uh, you know, because things were still ongoing. Yeah. So that year that I set out, um, which was the immediately after Lynn Bias' death the following season, I didn't play. And, but what I did do was, you know, in the midst of my uh, grieving, because that's what I was doing, you know, along with the rest of my teammates, yeah. I kept seeing Lenny in the weight room. And I kept seeing Lenny in the gym in my mind. And I kept seeing Lenny on the court, you know, in my mind. And I kept thinking to myself, like, you know, part of me, um, you know, thought about not playing anymore. And, and, and like, because like, this can't be like, you know, maybe this is not for me, you know, and maybe this is a sign that I should, you know, that I shouldn't be playing. But then the other side of me was like, would not let me, you know, not play. I had to play. And not only did I have to play, you know, I had to, I had to make myself into what I said I wanted to be when I went there. And mm -hmm. so with me seeing them constantly seeing them visions of Lenny in my mind, I just, I dedicated myself to the weight room. I dedicated myself to the gym. I couldn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I wasn't eligible to play, so I couldn't be around the team. So I couldn't practice with the team. So I practiced, I played basketball with football players. <laughs> you know, that's what, you know, <laughs> when you first got, one of the first things I'm sure you noticed is the relationships that the basketball players had with the football team. Like they were all hung out with them dudes. And, and for me, I got immersed in, 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 in the culture to, you know, from a weight room perspective, just working out with them and, and, and playing basketball with them because they were crazy physical. They were ridiculously strong and they were way more athletic than anybody would have ever thought for how big they were. Yeah. And so once I started to bang around with an all pro type in like Furrow Edmonds, uh, you know, uh, guys like, you know, Warren Powers, you know, six, seven, two ninety. Big Ben, you remember real well, you know, yeah. Big Ben, 6'9", 335 pounds, you know. And these were the guys that I used to, you know, play basketball with on a daily basis at that point. So I dedicated that year to forging my body into what I wanted to be. And for me, at that point, when I turned 19 and I stopped growing, you know, vertically, that's when I started to be able to put on weight. And it was that year. From I, that was the year that the weight room really kicked in for me, and and my body, I sort of grew into my body, and I came back the following year, you know, a much better player, a bigger, stronger player, and I became the guy that, that you saw <laughs> when you came on campus because you had seen Lynn Byers play, and you knew, you know, I was the skinny, I was the skinny dude that would get in, you know, that would start a couple of games here and there, <laughs> but like he was swole, bro. <laughs> He's like this. <laughs> and came back ready. So, because I was that first game was when I was eligible to play. And by the way, um, you got to consider this for me as well. Not only did I miss that year, but I was eligible to play that first semester of my sophomore year. And Bob Wade set me out for another semester. Um, so I didn't get to play a full semester of my sophomore year that I should have gotten to play. And when I came back, I came back as a starter because I was killing dudes in practice. I was, you know, it was obvious that like I was going to be a starter at that point because I was one of the best post players on a, on a team that featured seven, you know, all Americans right. and brought in some dudes at, you know, the power forward and center position. But I managed to get into the starting lineup because I wanted it just that bad. And I had my first game as a, you know, fresh, you know, off a year and a half layoff, dropped 25 and, and whatever against South Carolina, who was ranked, I think, at that time. And we set the whole world on notice um, yeah, that sure. we were, in, you know, a team to be contended with. So uh, when you talk about playing for three coaches, 
Um, I just told you about the left experience. Um, you know, it's unfortunate for Bob Wade that, you know, we assembled a team like that and were able to make that team, that team that had all those All-Americans on it. In 87, 88, we went to the second round of the NCAAs. And unfortunately, that's not really celebrated at the University of Maryland. It's not something to really talk about because of the way that things went down with Bob Wade. But there was nothing illegal, um, you know, that the players were doing that we were involved with. And unfortunately for me, Wiz, if there's one thing that I could get people to understand, you know, about that time during that period between Lynn Bias's death and your ascension as the wizard and helping get the program back on the map in 1992 or, or 1991, rather, you know, the, the guys in between that, Derek Lewis, myself, you know, Keith Gatlin, you know, we wore University of Maryland jerseys. We didn't wear a University of Bob Wade jerseys. And there were a lot of people who hated Bob Wade um, around the University of Maryland. And that filtered down to the players. And for us to achieve what we achieved in 1987-88, to be back in the NCAAs less than two years after one of the biggest tragedies in the history of college basketball, says a lot for those guys who toughed it out and stayed there. And that's something I think should be celebrated. And unfortunately, there are not enough people, uh, there are not any people really that recognize that we accomplished something by getting back to the NCAAs and things went down the way that they did, but that wasn't players' fault. And, yeah. and wish that people would recognize that there were guys who really gave their blood, sweat, and tears. And I do mean real blood, real tears during that time that, you know, they, they, they loved the University of Maryland to the point where they stayed there and they went, they went through that. And a guy like me, I, I even prospered through it. Derek Lewis prospered and had a great career at the University. And, and so did Keith Gatlin. But, um, you know, because of the disdain for Bob Wade in so many so many people's eyes, you know, a lot of guys feel like that's, that, that, that goes unrecognized. And it mostly does because nobody talks about the fact that we did get to the NCAAs before Gary got, before the Gary got there. We know how great Gary was and Gary is. And we, you know, we, we know that, but there were guys who, who really gave it up and we just wished, a lot of us wish that people would just understand that, you know, we feel like that should be recognized a little bit because that was an accomplishment, especially when you consider what was going on during that time period. Hey, absolutely, man. I, I think that's a great testament to when you talk about uh, in the book about those times and, uh, you know, my documentary. Um, and then you talk about present day. I think it those things just it just continuously uh, reinforce um, the notion that, you know, the Terps, we've been through a lot. We've been through a lot of turmoil, but we always find that silver lining in the storm and kind of gravitate to that. We learn and we come back stronger. And so we've shown that over and over and over again. So you, and, and your career is a great testament to that for sure. So I, I just want to touch upon, you know, now, you know, uh, modern day, uh, the Terps of today, you know, what uh, Coach Turgeon leaving uh, during the season and, and, uh, had an up and down uh, uh, season all year, and but now uh, they're at the point where now uh, Kevin Willard is at the helm, um, seeming to bring some uh, assistant coaches that have uh, ties to the to the DMV, and you know hopefully some Turp guys on there as well. So, what, what is your thoughts about um, what's going on now in the new hire at, at University of Maryland? Uh, I think for the the one thing that the University of Maryland uh, is trying to do is to build a better relationship um, in the community as far as recruiting and being able to get some of these guys. And, and I think they brought in a coach who hopefully, uh, you know, will be able to, to reach some people. And he's brought in some assistant coaches who have some ties to the area. So I think that's a, a step in the right direction. I don't know a lot about him. I know, he, you know, he had some success at Seton Hall. And I, I think, you know, really what's going to this is going to be for me more of a kind of wait and see situation yeah. because I don't I don't think he's a bad hire at all I, I, at all. I just don't know how it's going to play out um, right now because I don't know enough about him. But I think um, I think he's a good guy uh, for the job from from what I understand. And and if he can build the relationships and, and we can get some some of the homegrown talent and if we can, you know, help bring back some of the alumni to the program and, and continue to, you know, try to build a brotherhood. I think that really would help us moving forward. 
Absolutely. I think that what's important is, uh, you know, being able to recruit, obviously, we have the best high school players in the country, but also, you know, this, this school just thrives off tradition and culture. And I think that has to do with, you know, who you have sitting over there on the bench. And so, yep. you know, that's why I mentioned, you know, you, you got to have some turps there, in, in my opinion, uh, for long term success. Um, and, and then you go from there. So, yeah, but so now switching the gears a little bit. So now you, you're in the NBA playing with the Hall of Famer and David Robinson, and you win an NBA championship, man. What in the world was that like? Well, it's two different things. So I, I, I so first of all, uh, I get drafted, right? Well, what did we say, 43rd? I was 43rd, right? Yeah, so um, when I came back, when I came back, um, to play the Wizards as a spur my rookie year. You guys were at that game, right, Wiz? Yes. My yes. First, first game back. I, you so, know what I remember about that game? I remember watching it. You gave us some good seats, man. We were right there on the floor. And I remember watching you guys, and I was thinking to myself, man, these guys not moving that fast out there, man. I can't wait to get out here. These guys moving slow. I did not realize that. It was because they are much, they look, they're much bigger. So it make it looks like they're moving slow, but it was not slow at all. <laughs> realize it's not nearly so once you get out there, then you yeah. realize things really are happening. So, so, but the one thing I do remember um, coming back, being drafted was after all those things like we just talked about Wiz, coming from the, you know, country boy, you know, unknown and didn't get any publicity until I went to camp, right? Um, you know, I was a Converse All-American, but not a, you know, parade All-American in high school. You know what I mean? So, like, I didn't get a lot of publicity. Um, and, and I wasn't a, a big splash when I signed at the University of Maryland. It was just kind of like, oh, okay, they got this kid, you know, from down south or whatever. All of those things from high school to the three coaches playing at the University of Maryland to everything that happened. You know, when I came back and I played that game, I looked back and I saw my former college teammates, you, you know, Broadnax and, and, and like all these guys, who, you know, I was just in the dorm with last year. You know, I, it, it excited me, man. It excited me. It just it made me feel like, wow, like I accomplished something finally. And, and, and so. You know, that was during the time, man, when in the layup line when I would just be dunking everything. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, I'm out there with Wiz. Like, I don't know if you remember Wiz, but I'm sure I was probably jumping high as hell. Hell <laughs> yes, bro. I remember, trust. <laughs> man, and just being on the team and being able to come back to my city and, and like, be a professional, which was my dream. So, um, and I was David Robinson's teammate at that point. So, again, I go from Len Bias you know, as a freshman to David Robinson as a rookie, right? Two, two dudes who I, I loved David Robinson also when I was in high school as a college player. Because, you know, I, you know, the big man was the thing. Like, that was mm -hmm. the thing then. Absolutely. So, so, um, so getting to play with David and, and getting to see what a professional he was and how he carried himself and how he dealt with his, with his, uh, with his fame. And you got to remember, Wiz, my rookie year, we flew commercial. Yeah, <laughs> my my rookie year too. I remember. As you're walking through the air, seven foot one superstar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that you every up to, they can see him a mile away, man. So it would be like a freaking circus sometimes with this guy. But um, but he was a great teammate, man. Uh, Terry Cummins was my vet, and, and like all of these guys, really taught me what it was like. Paul Pressy. Um, you know, Sean Elliott was a good friend of mine. You know, we were the same age. He was a year. Um, um, he was in the, already in the league a year before me, but we came out of the same high school class. And, and like to hang out with him, and like he was like you know the, the the hot new you know dude in town because he was he was a high draft pick the year before, and he had made the rookie team the whole nine. So you know he was like the dude, and playing with a point guard like Rod Strickland. So I got the real experience. Oh wow team man and, and like my rookie year was just unbelievable we ended up losing to what would be the ascension of run tmc mm -hmm. we they we were actually the high seed in the first round because the spurs had made it to the western conference finals a year before and so they were expected to you know have a chance to win a championship my rookie year so me and sean higgins and Dwayne shenses you know r.i.p uh we were the rookies 
And we were sitting there thinking like, ooh, we're going to get to go to the finals as rookies. <laughs> nope. <laughs> EOC, the first round, boy. Chris Chris Mullen, Mitch yeah. Richmond, all the way, man. When I tell you they went small on us, Tom Tolbert was a, was a five. Mm-hmm. And he was shooting wow. They bringing them away from the basket. When I tell you, man, they was giving us the business. They was giving us the business, man. I mean, they that's shot. All right. Well, that's all right. You guys came back and won a set, won a championship in seven game series against the Pistons. That was my first season. I, I got knocked in the first round. Now you fast forward 15 years later, 12 teams, 11 teams later, I'm a spur again. And then I win the championship with Tim Duncan, Manu, and, and Tony Parker. So, you know, I got redemption. Took right. 15 as a spur, you know, 15 years later with Pop as my coach, because Larry Brown was the coach my year. Right, right, right. So, so after you retired, man, uh, you played 15 years. And so now uh, you, you're a sports analyst for the Wizards and the Go-Go's. How did, how did you get into that? Was it, was it something you always wanted to do, or how did that come about? Yeah, I had an interest in it, and, you know, doing the, you know how you do interviews, a lot of interviews as a player, and I would you know, a lot of times get people that would tell me after the interview, like, hey, man, you know, you do a pretty good interview. You should think about maybe getting into business when you retire, you know, as an analyst or commentator. So I was like, really? He was like, yeah, yeah, you know, you should, you know, you should think about that. So I was like, all right, whatever. So I, I was going on playing my career, you know, having my career or whatever. And then about two years out, um, my agent got a call. Um, two years of me being retired, um, my agent uh, got a call from NBC requesting me to you know, to come in as a guest analyst. And so I came in and, um, and I did a spot and they liked me and then they invited me back a couple more times to do some stuff. And and then that, you know, the rest is, you know, pretty much history. And hey, um, man, you, 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 you're really good at what you do, man. I've seen you over the years, man. And you just, I mean, you're really good at, man. You're really breaking it down and understanding the game, being able to relay it to the, to the fans and all this. It's certainly a skill set to have. And, you, you seem like you have caught your stride in that for sure, man. So, Thank uh, you. yeah, for sure, you're doing it. Hey, Thank so look, look, this is my last question for you, Mass. Uh, Tell us something about yourself that most do not know. Uh, uh, most people don't know. Um, uh, you know what, Wiz, man? I'm a. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a homebody now, man. You know, you you remember me being young and you know what I mean, hanging out. <laughs> oh, you know, always have at some point, man. But you know, a lot of people and a lot of people think it's because you're, you know, former athlete or whatever that you still like the you know, quote unquote party lifestyle and stuff, man. But I, I you know, I, I like to just chill at home. I'm, I'm more of a mo- I'm a movie buff. That's what a lot of people don't know about me, man. I like like my old school, much like I like my old school rap music and, and you know, r and I like my old school movies, you know, so comedies and, and uh, you know, it's funny, you know, crazy stuff, you know, gangster movies, so action movie stuff like that. So that's Absolutely. something, you know, I, I guess maybe I've gotten away over the last, even way before COVID, you know, I've, I've been watching, you know, I've really been into just kind of chilling at home more like the last probably six, seven years. Man, that is awesome right there. Hey, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today, man. Listen, we we played in college together. We played on the Rockets together. We had a show called Who Wizards together. We wrote a book together. Good grief, man. You have been a, a, such an important part of my life. It's such a pleasure to be able to call you a friend, bro. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, man, for sure. Thank you for having me, Wiz. To host a fan show or appear as a fan on a fan show, create a profile in Fan Media Network. Then look for the news page in our website and fan show resources page. Help yourself. We give show hosts a show graphic and team colors, a simple short show format, tips on pre- and post-production, ideas to get fans and guests on your show, Apple News distribution and show sponsorship sales and services to help featured show hosts earn money. Show hosts use our iPhone app to publish their shows. Our website supports Android users.